So thank you so much for having me. I'll be talking about meibomian gland dysfunction and I'll be going through some of the current perspectives when it comes to diagnosis and management. So we know that over the last few years there has been a considerable increase in the understanding that we have of dry eye and that has led to a much greater scientific interest in the disease. What we also know now that about 60% of the patients that present to us with dry eye have meibomian gland dysfunction. So they have dry eye secondary to meibomian gland dysfunction and about 10 to 15% have a mixed component. This is the vicious cycle of dry eye that has been described. Dr. Hitendra also spoke about hyperosmolarity, inflammation, tear film uh, instability playing very important roles. So what is important here is that any of these etiological agents can lead an individual into this vicious cycle of dry eye which then self perpetuates and carries on even if you remove the original agent that got got the person into this cycle in the first place and of course meibomian gland dysfunction is at the core of this so in this cycle as well you can see proliferation of uh, bacteria in the flora of the eyelids and the conjunctiva which produce lipases esterases and other digestive enzymes and fatty acids that increase the melting temperature of meibom and that subsequently leads to the blockage of meibomian glands and further on to dropouts and atrophy of these glands and inflammation also plays an important role which leads to keratinization of meibomian gland orifices again leading to the same outcomes this is what leads to an unstable lipid layer subsequently translating into too much evaporation of tears from the ocular surface leading to a dry cornea and subsequently dry eye so when we are evaluating a patient with meibomian gland dysfunction or with any form of dry eye for that matter it's always best to start from the most non invasive investigation to the most invasive one because each investigation that you do subsequently has an impact on the next one an important tool that i like to use in my practice is the osdi questionnaire there are a lot of other questionnaires available as well and they're validated and equally good so you can use those as well the important thing with questionnaires is that you're able to document how symptomatic the patient is in the first place when the patient comes to you and then when you start your treatment you can monitor over time and see how the patient is responding to the treatment that you give them i'll be talking about some of the specialized tests that are available i'll be talking about the benefits and the drawbacks of each and i have no financial interests in any of these so the first one that i'll be talking about is the tear lab osmolarity kit so the the tfos dues to report is also stressed a lot now on tear film osmolarity because it's it's a much more objective measurement of dry eye so somebody who has a high osmolarity value has more severe dry eye so this is this is an instrument that gives you that measurement the the disadvantage and the drawback here is that the repeatability is an issue sometimes you you do the same investigation in the same patient after some time and you'll realize that the value is a little different so that is where for me this instrument uh, is not up to the mark in that way Inflamadry is another important kit which is available now. What this does is it detects MMP9 levels in tears. So this is basically telling you if there is inflammation in the eye. Based on this, you can decide if you would like to include steroids or other anti-inflammatory agents in your treatment regimen. So the 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 drawback for this is that this is going to tell you that there is inflammation in the eye. This will not be telling you if there is inflammation in the eye because of dry eye or because of something else it could even be vkc or maybe even an infective conjunctivitis so that is something that you have to see and clinically decide the other important tool that we use in our practice routinely is now the lipi view tool which basically uses interferometry and visualizes the lipid layer of the tear film in addition to that you also get the blink dynamics and you get imaging from the meibomian glands So what you see here is on the left side is an individual with a very healthy looking thick lipid layer where you have a lipid layer thickness of more than 100 nanometers. On the right what you see with this blink is an individual with a with a much more dull looking lipid layer and the lipid layer thickness here is about 39 nanometers. So this is somebody with evaporative dry eye and this is somebody that you would like to treat on looking at these interferometric images. Also you get these images of partial blinks what this is able to tell you is that if there is a a high ratio of partial blinks you might you might want to give a lubricant gel or ointment because the tears are not getting distributed too well in this particular patient so this patient might benefit from additional lubrication or lubrication that lasts a little longer in the eye 
and these are meibomian gland images that you see what you see on top here is an individual with relatively normal meibomian gland so there is some amount of toxicity here but otherwise not much dropouts however when you look at the individual below you see there is a huge amount of dropouts of glands so this is somebody who's 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 likely had chronic and very long lasting meibomian gland dysfunction there is also amoebo scoring that has been proposed depending on the degree of dropouts that exist and you can score the the i from score 0 to score 3 and when it comes to managing meibomian gland dysfunction the aim of the treatment becomes to break that vicious cycle that i had spoken about so each each intervention that we take acts on different components of the visual uh, of the vicious cycle and some on multiple components of it so for example oral tetracyclines would act on the inflammation and in addition to that also re re reduce the bacterial load that exists and steroids again would target the inflammation lipids would would help take care of the lipid layer deficit and lubricants and lid hygiene also act on different parts of this vicious cycle that needs to be broken for us to be able to bring back the homeostasis of the tear film warm compresses and manual lid expression do form the first line of the treatment and they do play an important role but the issue that exists with warm compression is that you are applying heat at the external surface of the lids whereas the meibomian glands exist closer to the inner surface of the lid so even if you are able to maintain sufficient temperature at the external surface you do not necessarily get that at the level of the meibomian glands so that is where the lippy flow or the vector thermal pulsation system helps because it has these cups which you place in the palpebral fissure and the heat is applied from the inner surface of the eyelid and you get pressure pulsations from the external surface so it's a it's a 12 minute cycle uh, you can see the the pressures and the temperature slowly building up and subsequently at the end of the procedure you get a report of the treatment having been done so this has there are quite a few rcts available as well now which have found that vector thermal pulsation is more effective than warm compresses both in terms of objective measurements of dry eyes as well as the symptoms of patients a very genuine drawback here is the cost it's it's a pretty expensive procedure and you cannot really offer it to all the patients in addition to that if somebody has a huge amount of gland dropouts then you really need to counsel the patient well because the benefit that that patient is going to get from lippy flow or from any any treatment for that matter is not going to be very very significant because there are already a huge number of glands that have been lost and those glands don't come back there are certain other modalities available as well that that play an important role such as these eyelid heating masks so what you see here is a usb based heating mask and the person sits comfortably with the controls in his hand so he can adjust the temperature depending on what is tolerable to him and if you look at the graph on the right side you see that the different masks that have been shown all of them are able to get uh, get reasonably good temperature profiles at least at the external surface of the lids and when you look at the red line that is what what is a face cloth so definitely not getting the right temperatures there with the face cloth as compared to these masks this is uh, another instrument which is available which is called the meibo thermo flow which again provides heat from the external surface and you do see symptomatic improvement in patients with this as well but the limitation with both the things that i just mentioned is that you are applying heat from the external surface and not from the internal surface so there is not much data that compares all of these modalities there is one small study that i was able to find and in that it is mentioned that lippy flow is able to get better temperature profiles at the level of the meibomian glands but there is more literature that is needed on this another modality that is catching on and and becoming extremely popular now is intense uh, pulsed light because this was originally used for rosacea and other skin conditions and dermatologists had been using it but it has now been found to be effective in mgd as well so this provide bursts of light at specified areas of the skin and it basically helps by reducing the vasculature around the meibomian glands which reduces inflammation and also plays a role by uh, by the heat that it provides so that is also another factor however when the original publications by toyos and and the original group had come out they had stated that 
this is not really known for its efficacy and safety in the pigmented population so for us for our population which is primarily pigmented we need more data to really see if if it is effective in our scenario so to conclude uh, meibomin gland dysfunction dysfunction is an underdiagnosed and undertreated entity but extremely significant and extremely common causing dry eyes in a lot in a lot of patients there are a whole range of new diagnostic instruments that are available now and uh, it it is really up to the practitioner to see what is more relevant in their practice and also in terms of the cost settings there are a whole range of treatment solutions that are available as well now some have been there for longer and have more literature to support their efficacy and safety whereas some are more recent and need to be looked at a little more closely so thank you uh, thank you tushar uh, the audience is brimming with questions so uh, 